You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Matthew. Andrew, what's up, brother? Hey, man. <laughs> Are we being all formal today? We Jasmine. are. Jasmine. <laughs> Madam Pinnagrass. <Madame> Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to elevate the conversation. Yeah, yeah. yep, exactly. Instead of plunging into the normal depths that I do at the start of every show. <laughs> Some obtuse comment or reference. Yep, yep. <laughs> trying, to, trying, to, trying to be a better person, Jasmine. Yeah, right, trying. Right. I'm here for Thanks the Thanks for elevation. calling me out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Folks, this is Shoe and Show. Um, we cover every topic within the footwear industry. Our focus mainly is on the business side, about how a shoe uh, gets to a shelf. Yep. And once it's on the shelf or in the warehouse, how it's sold. So everything throughout the entire process. And over the past couple of months, we've talked to a lot of folks about what's hot and what's selling. Yeah. We also talked to a lot of material people, compliance people. But there's something at the very beginning of the process. And yeah. We've talked to a few designers here or there, but nothing really in depth like we're going to talk about today. Yeah, but I'm it's so really, excited. Me too. But it, it it's so nice to talk to someone who starts the entire process from scratch. Yeah. From their mind's eye, something that they have in their mind that they it just keeps coming back to them that they've got to design and sketch out yep. and see if they can bring it uh, all the way through the process to fruition. Yeah, I, I, you nailed it, Andy. It's, so, it's like that that wine, the person who grows the grapes and crushes it into beautiful wine. It's that, that artisan that right. is uh, a carpenter. And our next guest can be kind of put into that same category. Marcel Mersan is a shoemaker, a designer. He He's a developer. He's an educator. He's kind of a footwear renaissance man. Yeah. He's got his own YouTube channel. Uh, he's worked in higher education as it relates to uh, making sure people understand and and ensure that it's not a lost art, but the but the art of shoemaking. Marcel, we can't thank you enough for coming on the Shoe and Show. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for featuring me here. I really appreciate that I have a chance to talk about my my craft. Yeah, no, we're really excited about it because uh, Andy and I and Jasmine, we've been in factories all over the world. We've been in all. We've been we've seen it all. Uh, but there's something about a craftsman who is who has the technical expertise, but also the design eye and the ability to communicate that to people. And you kind of encapsulate all that. So what we always do with, with many of our shoe and show guests, we ask them their shoe story, Marcel. So tell us what your shoe story is. How did you, how did you get to where you are today? Well, uh, my story goes back to 1805 when my family uh, moved to Hungary and the family history says from Greece, and they found their tannery in there. Then um, all the um, offspring from the, from the, from that uh, great 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 grandfather went somewhere into the leather industry. And somehow my my uh, side of the family we went into the footwear, and uh, you know it's not very well documented. A lot a lot of things uh, lost in the history from that time. So the first mention I have is 1844 when my ancestor went to his master journey and uh, came back after several years as a master of his craft. And since then, we uh, probably can say that uh, at least one of the members of the family is uh, continuing the tradition. So I usually say that I am the sixth generation master shoemaker in the family. Probably it's a lot more, but that's that's something I can, I can guess and I can prove. Um, the... How did I get the to the to the craft? So I was 14. I had to choose uh, something to do with my life after school, and at that point of my life, I, I wasn't quite sure what I should do. And my mom was just like, "Hey, so why don't you try, let's say, shoemaking?" And I was like, "Yeah, it sounds cool." And I didn't even know that it was the family tradition because you know it wasn't like. Uh, something surrounding me. Of course, it was somewhere there, but I mean, we had 40 years of communism in the country. It's wiped out all these small um, family businesses. So it wasn't there anymore. And I said, yeah, sure, let's do that. And I went to the school. I, I loved it. And slowly, slowly, I learned that actually this is something meant to be. And this is the family tradition. I was very, very uh, appreciated that they didn't just push me in there like, 
you have to do this because this is a family tradition and no other choices for you. It was kind of, you know, a way that I felt like it was my choice and I never ever uh, regretted this choice for one quick second. So I went to school when I was 14 and since then I did quite a lot of other things as well, of course. Um, I went to other schools. I had my uh, degree in economy, but shoemaking was always there, and I'm I'm just you know grateful for for the life uh, shoemaking gave gave to me. Yeah, I mean it's it sounds like it was your first love, and what's so cool about that now you've you are um, and many and our listeners can go to shoemakingcourse.com to to learn more about what Marcel is up to since he was 14 years old. But now you're in Savannah, Georgia, and you're teaching this craft, uh, what is kind of, what, what is kind of the main reason that people come to you to learn and what is kind of the biggest surprise when it comes to the, the students that you bring in to help walk them through shoemaking, uh, walk us through that process. All right. So there are basically two types of people come to my classes. Um, one of them, and, and there are a lot more from these kind of people who just want to do something with their time and, uh, they think that shoemaking is something cool they can do as a hobby. They, it's kind of true. Um, as a hobby, it's, it's a tough hobby, but they can, can surely do that. And they're surprised when they actually realize that they can make a pair of shoes in one or two weeks and they can walk away with that shoe. That's something fantastic. The way they continue, that's, that's the cash because it's going to be really expensive to buy all the machinery and stuff. So it's not like, it's not going to be competition for the industry, of course. The other type of people the designers, the professional designers, technical experts, who surprisingly, some of them never ever had a proper footwear education. Some of them had some kind of footwear education, but when you actually make something with your hands to shape a piece of uh, leather to a piece of shoe, a pair of shoes, that is something really fantastic. So these people, when they come and they learn from the basics, what they always do, but only on paper and pencil, that is just like a renovation, just like, oh my God, it's possible. And they learn a lot. They understand things what they never understood before. I could go into details, which are those details, but just the fact that they can finish something from scratch, that is just something what you can never learn on paper. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because I, I see on your website, you do have these corporate courses for for kind of continuous education and since we represent 80 percent of the industry the full industry we we often run into kind of new talent on the design side or the marketing side or development that comes in and they don't necessarily have all the tools at their disposal about shoe construction and how shoe is made and uh, they may not they may have been in a factory but probably not and so it's so important to have an opportunity like they have at shoemakingcourse.com for you to, for folks to come and really provide the foundation, the educational foundation that they need to be successful as new talent within the footwear industry. We run into this all the time, and I think that's a great service that you can provide. Well, I do my best, you know. So people think that uh, for why it's important as a designer to learn about technology um, because you know, you eventually want to realize your designs and maybe it's going to be you, maybe it's going to be the design director who travels to Far East and, and deal with the factory, but uh, you can achieve one thing many different ways. And if you work with a pattern maker, a technical expert on the other side as, a, as an equal expert, so you know exactly that scene is possible what you figured. And you know that even uh, one certain technical solution makes the product way better. Those little details which adds to the price tag, and you can communicate those details, you can describe those details, you can correct the factory. You know, factories, I mean, they do their best to keep you as a customer, but they, on the other hand, uh, have to do all the shortcuts to, to keep it a uh, reasonable price. So you can be there and tell them that, hey, this is possible, you can do this for me, and this is not going to be any more difficult than what you uh, come up with. And those are, this is the knowledge what I think all the designers should have and be able to communicate. Hey, Marcel, I think I saw you post up on LinkedIn that you actually created a new kind of pattern making tool. Um, maybe you can, oh, thank you. yeah, maybe you can describe that process. Like what, what it, for a lot of people out there who, who, you know, are not in design or development um, and, and haven't gone through the process of shoe construction or shoe making, what, what exactly are the tools that have been used in the past for pattern making? And then 
what what is the need for an upgrade uh, for, for for a pattern making tool that you're actually uh, have made and launched? All right, thank you very much. So uh, let's start with a, with a little history. So when uh, we started to even make patterns, well, we always made patterns, but in the middle of the 19th century, a guy called Robert Murta, who is our Leonardo da Vinci in the Hutra industry, it's a shame mm. that not too many people know his name. He came up with a method, what he called the geometric method to create a, a shoe pattern. And from that time, the shoe patterns... Uh, radically changed. He came up with a bunch of other method, mathematic methods to calculate the, the materials, the, the work, and so on and so on, but his biggest contribution was the patterning method. And every patterning method comes from his work and his original book of pattern making. And there's a system for pattern making. You can do it even without the last. Of course, with the last, you can combine this method, come up with way better uh, methods. Why it has relevance? Um, so, when we talk about classic um, proportions, that those are the proportions which we all try to accomplish. The classic lines, even if you give an extra twist, the classic lines are the ones we build our shoes on. The loafers, the derbies, the wingtips, the toe caps. When you take a look at the shoe and you just see that, all right, this is good, but mm, I don't know. I'm going to keep looking. It's not what I'm looking for. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. So the reason can be that it's not perfect proportionally and our eyes are trained to see certain proportions nice certain proportions proportions not too nice so this pattern ruler has the basic functions what you need to create nice classic designs and a lot more so i just created this uh ruler not not a long time ago and uh, it has over 30 functions if you have this on your table you don't need to use any other ruler or um angle, scale, or anything else, this is just perfect to create a pattern in a really short amount of time. And you can ask that, okay, so what is the relevance? Why do we need to use a ruler? We have gorgeous computers for that. Well, here's the answer. Not everybody has those computers with those fancy softwares. Right. And, and, and students definitely don't have those things. And the good pattern makers still work on the lost. And they scan their patterns, and they turn into a computer work, a CAD software and then they make the pattern piece so even this this is a seems like a very old-fashioned way to create a pattern it still has a lot of relevance and you know what even if you're going to be a computer pattern maker you will still make your first patterns by hand just to make sure you understand what is going on there mm. let me ask you this uh, marcel you know that's super innovative, which is really cool. When you think of like craftsmanship and traditional shoemaking, innovation is not at the top of one's mind, but I think it's, I mean, that's a perfect example of ways in which you're looking to improve the process. Um, what do you think are kind of the biggest challenges facing this craft right now as it relates to, is it, is it availability materials? Is it um, expectations of the consumer? Is it... Is it the fact that is it a, that, that there are less and less of you here in the U.S. who understand this craft? What are some of the big challenges you think as a craftsman, and as you continue to kind of think through the you know the best path for, best path forward for the industry and in ensuring that what you are doing is sustained and even expanded upon? Well, thank you for the question. It's it's a, it's a really great one. I think two things. So one of them is education. Um, just because you see craftsmen, and it's, even if it feels like it's a renaissance of craft, um, that's kind of misleading because, yes, of course, uh, people appreciate this craft more and more, and uh, you might see more and more Instagram profiles making shoes, but after all, there's no uh, next generation of shoemakers. There's a few people getting into the craft, and uh, half of my students actually are older than I am, which is, you know, really great. It's a really fantastic thing. But to be honest, the ones who can keep up the flame are the young generation. Hmm. And if it's, this uh, craft is not sexy enough to carry on, then they're going to do something different. And that's now how craft can survive. The other thing is the, the, the marketing. So let's talk about a little bit uh, cooking. You can see millions of shows about cooking. I mean, not millions, but a lot of shows cooking in, yeah. in every, everywhere. And there's not one single show about 
the traditional craft. And I understand why I, I had this conversation with the producer and they, they said, that, okay, let's do it and, and let's do it. And in a way that we find 12 workshops and they can do a shoe. And that's what, that's what I said, you know what? Stop right there. We're not going to find 12 workshops making shoes. That's impossible. That's not going to happen in this country. So if we could have a little bit more uh, television, and that's why it's fantastic that I can be here and talk about it, uh, that probably could change radically the, the picture of the crop because right now everybody, everybody's impression is, oh, it's a dying crop, it's a lost master shoemaker, it's a lost this and this, mm -hmm. and that's so negative. And it, it shouldn't be negative. It should be something uh, positive. People can make stuff from their from leather with their hands, and that product is, is valuable. It's a long-lasting product. This is this is the angle which I would love to see in the media. Yeah, no, it's that's a great angle, and I think that you know that's what one of the things. There's so many sexy aspects that are drawing millennials to them: the design, the marketing side. But but what we find is, I mean, even when we have a course where we are just talking the basics of leather sourcing, there's a kind of there's a lot of people who don't have don't kind of understand that, and I think what you're doing. And maybe hopefully with this interview and other things you're doing, we can get even more awareness around of the importance of the craft, the craftsman side of shoe production. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, even if those shoes aren't made here, it gives these professionals a, an awareness of what goes into it, no matter where they're made. But I think we're entering into a phase where we've had a number of conversations with designers and developers and sourcing folks over the last, uh, over the last few episodes where people are talking about, you know, the ways to efficiently build more product here it may not mean there's a ton of labor Im involved, but there might be ways to be more innovative and it, it has to go back to the original, original craftsman side of that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we don't want, I mean, I, I, I can say this, we don't, we, uh, craftsmen don't want to cover the market. That's impossible. We are well aware of that. We know that our product is not going to be a competition for a store shoe, and we don't want to be in that position because we cannot make shoes for, I don't know, $50, $60. Right. I mean, an e ball and also cost more than that. But we just want to be in a place where we have a tiny, tiny segment of the market where customers understand what is the difference. So I don't want to answer questions. I mean, of course I do. But I don't want to get into the situation where I need to explain what is the difference between my, let's say, the cheapest model I sell is $550. Why the $560 is $560 instead of the, I don't know, the same looking shoe for $40? What is the difference? I mean, you know, that's, that's major differences. But when it comes to food, people perfectly understand that junk food and a handcrafted burger, there's a major difference right. even in the price. That is very true. <laughs> you don't understand that difference. Oh, I understand that difference perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> now you're speaking my language. <laughs> hey, Marcel. I burgers. Yeah, exactly. Marcel, I, I have a question for you as well on, on kind of technology. You, you, hit, you, you talked a little bit about CAD's design and, and things like that. I'm sure there's more and more of that being incorporated because of the efficiencies. What do you think about um, the technologies used today where – where we can get scans of people's feet and and maybe create shoes that better fit them. How do you see craftsmen using these kind of tools in the future to to ensure that the the shoes you're making kind of fit a little bit better? And, and I think already the craftsmen already have that down pat. That's why you buy your shoes versus the forty dollars shoes. Obviously, is the look and feel. But how do you use these technologies? How do you see the use of these technologies being used? Are, are you interested in these or are these not something you're very interested in? Okay. Uh, so um, I don't use technology and I'm very well aware of the technology because mm -hmm. I used in the past, but here's the, here's the thing. Um, when you go to get a custom suit, a custom shoe, you want to have personal attention. You right. want to have someone going down to your foot, take the measuring tape, squeeze your foot a little bit here, uh, make sure that your toes are straight and not as you step out from the shoe. Right. You want to have a service. And that service is when you have the fitting shoe, you're going to have the fitting shoe maybe for a week to wear, then come back to the shoemaker, so adjust the, the lost and, and get that. If I just ask the customer to step into these shiny, beautiful, uh, expensive boxes, step mm -hmm. out and have a good day, 
that's not the same service. Right. And about comfort, you know what is the most comfortable shoe? The one which can be shaped to your foot. Because whatever shape we do, um, I think the bed is a good example. The perfect bed, what shapes just like your body. And it's going to be perfectly comfortable as long as you don't want to turn to your right or left side because it's going to be very uncomfortable from that point. So a good bed is you can shape it to your body and, and just gives you a good comfort. The shoe is the same. Um, if the loft is shaped perfectly, and we have done that way before computers even appeared, but these days we do it in a, in a way that we give, give a lot of cushioning, we give, give support to arches, which not supposed to be supported in the long term because they're just going to get lazy. Um, so comfort is, is a is a really great question and, and it's a long ongoing conversation about support. I have this with, with doctors and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the, the computer will give the solution for that because guess what? Fashion, we squeeze toes. We, we want to put uh, pointy square toes lost on people's feet, which doesn't look like a, an actual uh, foot. But you know what? If 50% of the population can fit into that, we are happy about that. Mm. So if you want to do comfort, okay, no problem. Don't squeeze the big toe. And that's comfort is to look <laughs> anything what <which> people, <laughs> Some common people sense. would wear for, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You could tell Marcel. Don't, don't give any support. You yeah. could you could tell Marcel is a good educator because he's awesome with the analogies, yeah. whether it's pivoting to mattresses or food <laughs> or something else. He speaks our language. Marcel, um, last question before we throw it over to Jasmine. Um, tell us kind of more about upcoming events, uh, upcoming workshops. We know this will air at a certain time, but you have these ongoing courses. Tell us some of the courses that you focus in on. What are some of the subject matters um, that you are focused on in your different courses? Well, I'm going to start a series of courses in New York very soon about uh, footwear vocabulary and pattern making. Uh, all of these courses are listed in uh, shoemakingcourse.com. And one other thing which I want to mention is the Footwear Makers Guild. We are doing a symposium in every year. Um, this year is going to be in Savannah, but every, every, other, every year is going to happen at least once where all the footwear people, industry, um, craftsmen comes together, share their experience, learn from professionals, from doctors, from orthopedic shoemakers, and uh, hopefully going to get a lot of inspiration for that. So that's the other thing which I would highly recommend people to participate. It's, we try to keep it in a way that it doesn't make us a lot of money, just covers the cost. So, and you can join to the guild as well, which uh, we have, well, very ambitious um, goals in the future like education and promotion of the craft so basically that's it the course is uh, going to go continuously in savannah this is very hands-on very small groups and uh, whatever they sign up for they can learn very ancient uh, constructions maybe purely by hand little machine whatever they sign up for no, that sounds awesome. And as you as you prop up this Shoemakers Guild, we're, we'd love to support that as an organization. So let's let's talk offline about that in more detail because I'm very interested. Um, with that, let's toss it over to Jasmine for her world famous fashion footwear and focus segment. Jasmine, um, how's okay. it going? <laughs> so you can't really talk about footwear without bringing up Kanye West and his collection um, his season um, Yeezy six, season 6 has come out he didn't do a traditional um, presentation for them which was really weird but he had a really interesting social media campaign he had everybody looking like Kim Kardashian they all recreated her looks and had on his shoes and clothes on so that was really interesting we've seen kind of Kim Kardashian clones um, the standout piece out of the newest collection is the flat form slippers which are really interesting it's like slippers are like slides are really popular but these ones are have cushion all over them and they're also like a platform at the bottom so they're heightened he also has a dad shoe that he calls the mud rat sneaker um, and they kind of actually look like a rat they're bulky and um, they're tailored off at the front of it and even like how the once you tie them it kind of looks like the whiskers of a of a um like a rat it's just kind of interesting but i'm kind of into the silhouette of them i'm not, <laughs> I'm not i don't know that. if marcel has seen some of the designs that um 
has been made, um, not even from this this collection, but just of Kanye West. And if you're a fan of them, yeah, hey, yeah, Marcellus brings to mind when uh, Kanye accepted an award at Fort Worth News. And he talked about going going and sitting down with materials and going you know going through that process. What do you think? How do you think uh, Kanye would do in a in a Marcel Marsan uh, course at shoemakingcourse.com? <laughs> I'm pretty sure she, he would do pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm not much into making those shoes, but since I was in education for seven years, you can believe me, I seem old crazy, so a red shoe is not even a uh, <laughs> level five. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think you'll learn how to make ugly dad shoes at Marcel's uh, courses. <laughs> Well, probably not. <laughs> Folks, you can come to my course for ugly shoe making. <laughs> All right. Or barbecue shoes. <laughs> well, Mar- you know, technology is the same, so you can make ugly shoes the same kind of before the night shoes as well. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So- That's right. We don't use any rulers in my course making. So oh, no. Disaster. It's just kinda, yeah. It's just, well. w- it's just whatever you can make and throw in your shoe. <laughs> I'm not promising that you come out of my course having any kind of shoe or anything like that. Sounds like you need to go to Marcel's course instead. Probably. <laughs> Probably, definitely. Well, <laughs> Marcel, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, again, Matt, what was the website that uh, folks uh, can shoe, go to? Shoemakingcourse.com. Shoemakingcourse.com. You can yep. learn more about Marcel and what he's doing. Uh, if you're a corporate, uh, if you're a corporate brand or, or you're, you're a corporation and you're interested in having him come, definitely go to the site and take a look at what he does. Uh, I know he's done this for several different brands, and uh, and of course Matt. I uh, was discussing with him earlier about the workshops that are coming up. So, Marcel, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and insights. Uh, and um, really congratulations on the on the new kind of pattern ruler. Uh, I thought that was really cool and really innovative. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much, much for, for the compliments for the ruler. I'm really much looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, folks, this is Shoe and Show. You can get us uh, on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Uh, the, web, well, the web address is shoeandshow.com. Um, if you have any uh, ideas for show topics, guests that we should uh, interview and have on, if you yourself would like to be a go, uh, get, uh, ghost uh, <laughs> guest, uh, please let us know. Um, and uh, for Jasmine, Matt, and myself, until next time, Shoe In is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.